on this Saturday night, pushing the limits. Ontario goes back to full capacity for major sporting events and concerts. Is it too much too soon for other provinces? If we open up um, very quickly, then what, what is the outcome? Why restaurants, gyms and other businesses won't see restrictions lifted just yet. The U.S. holds its first face-to-face -face talks with the Taliban since the militant group's takeover of Afghanistan. Plus, the pandemic pivot to being your own boss. COVID forced me, like a lot of other people, to take that risk. And the inspiring life of Nadia Chaudhry, the legacy of a beloved professor who shared her final journey with the world. Global National with Robin Gill. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. It's the tale of two Canadas in the fourth wave. While BC maintains a cap on sporting arenas, theaters, and concert halls, those venues are permitted to be packed in Ontario and Quebec as both provinces lift capacity limits as of today. Now, while it signals a semblance of the before times, as Kamil Karmali reports, the move has frustrated many small and medium-sized businesses who feel they've once again been left out. It's been a confusing shift for some businesses. I don't understand it. Ontario and Quebec announcing they're lifting the attendance cap for major public spaces like concerts and sporting events this week. But bars and restaurants remain limited. It's not fair to just, again, one more time, scapegoating of the restaurant industry and small businesses. And that also includes Ontario gyms. For me, it's pretty confusing. To be honest, um, you know, we're as safe as any other place. The province of Ontario tells Global News restaurants and bars are higher risk settings. Prolonged close contact in enclosed spaces where face coverings are removed for the entire duration when seated. If restaurants are also in the indoor space checking vaccine records to make sure people who are dining inside, it seems it doesn't make sense to me. But in British Columbia, it's the complete opposite. No venue limits in gyms and restaurants, but there is an attendance cap for concerts and sports. Like Canucks games. Vancouver is now the only team in the NHL not allowed to fill every seat in their home arena, with seating limited to 50%, leaving fans divided. I like the capacity limits. I think it's better for the fans and everything. It's a full arena. Health experts argue the difference still comes down to where you live, eat, and play. If you look at your rates of COVID per capita, you're not doing as well in BC as other provinces are in central or eastern Canada. The number of active COVID-19 cases per 100,000 people in BC is at 124. Compare that to Ontario, which is sitting at 31. Would you start packing stadiums in BC at this moment? You know, you got to see what direction you're headed in. The Canucks say they've been in close contact with public health and are optimistic they'll be able to hold games at full capacity by late October. Meanwhile, the BC government also says it's planning on making a decision soon. Farah. Kamel Karmali in Vancouver. Thanks, Kamel. The U.S. is now accepting travelers who receive vaccines approved by American regulators or the World Health Organization. But it is unclear if having mixed doses could still be a hurdle for Canadians heading south. Health Minister Patty Haidu is on the West Block this weekend, and Mercedes Stevenson joins us now with what's coming up. Mercedes. Faro, the federal government is mandating vaccination for domestic air and rail travel in Canada, but there are still lots of questions about international travel and what Canadians who have received mixed doses of the COVID-19 vaccine will and won't be able to do under new vaccination requirements being introduced in countries like the United States. The U.S. does not recognize anyone who received mixed vaccines, for example, one shot of AstraZeneca and one of Pfizer, as being fully vaccinated. That could have a significant impact for many Canadians who want to travel to the U.S., from snowbirds and vacationers to those traveling for business or to see family. 
Uh, I spoke with Secretary Becerra before the election. This is something that I think all countries are working through, which vaccines will they accept as proof of vaccination for entry into the country? And we're going to continue to work with our American counterparts to share all the data they need to, to move on this issue. We'll also talk to the health minister about when COVID vaccines might be approved for children in Canada, something lots of Canadians are talking about as families with kids gather for Thanksgiving. There is still no shot approved for children under 12 in Canada, and many parents are worried about another school year that could be interrupted by COVID closures. I asked Minister Haidu where Canada is at in the process of approving a vaccine for kids. We do know that uh, Pfizer has submitted some data to Health Canada regulators, but we expect the full package in the next uh, week or two. And then the regulators will uh, do what they do, which is review all of that data and evidence, um, including potentially visiting some of the uh, manufacturing sites uh, to assure that they are confident in the safety data and the efficacy data. Haidu also says the Health Canada review will likely be expedited to move quickly on the information that Pfizer has provided. We'll also talk about whether Canadians should expect a booster shot and when a promising COVID treatment might be approved for use here. Farah? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thank you, Mercedes. The village of Lytton, British Columbia, went up in flames earlier this year after days of unprecedented heat. Months later, hundreds of residents have yet to return to their homes, still scattered in hotels, living with family members, or in one of few houses that are still standing there. Global BC's Imad Agahi visited the town 100 days after disaster struck. She doesn't talk about it, but her, her behaviour definitely shows that she's stressed. There's no danger, but just about everything surrounding them is a reminder of that Wednesday afternoon at the end of June. But I'm really easily triggered, the smell of smoke, the sound of a helicopter, anything, a weird looking cloud especially. Well, the whole town was on fire. You know, the reserve was on fire. You know, people were running for their lives. In just minutes, hundreds evacuated. Two people were killed. Now, 100 days later, many have not returned because they no longer have a home here. In the days that followed the disaster, government promised to support and rebuild. Those displaced are now frustrated that the process has been slow. Disappointing. Lots of words, not a lot of action. Toxicity reports have come back to show exactly what first responders had warned about from the get-go. What was burned in the fire is extremely hazardous and now there are delays trying to figure out how to safely transport the wreckage and where it could even be disposed. So we have food and hygiene products and cleaning supplies and anything that you really need, like necessities. This is all a lot of people have right now. With no food store in Lytton, relief centers like the one here at the Scapa First Nation are stepping up to feed people with donations they've received. Forestry helicopters. Megan Fandridge believes her house was saved by a last second drop from a helicopter water bucket. Without income from her burned business and a community to rely on, <laughs> the future for her and five-year-old Helen is completely uncertain. There's no words for it. And also dependent on the rebuild of Lytton. Emadagahi, Global News. An Indigenous policing model could have saved Rodney Levi's life. That's according to his family. The Mi'kmaq man was shot fatally by police in New Brunswick last summer. Bolstering Indigenous policing is among 18 new recommendations for the RCMP. They were issued by a coroner's inquest looking into Levi's case in hopes of stopping deaths like his from happening again. Ross Lord reports. For the Levi family, finding positives hasn't been easy. Their brother, Rodney, was shot to death by New Brunswick RCMP in June of 2020. He had approached officers with two large kitchen knives in an agitated state. At a coroner's inquest, family members felt helpless, unable to ask questions because they did not have legal standing. You know, it was a big roller coaster all these eight days, and uh, I'm just glad today that uh, we could finally breathe. The inquest's jury concluded their brother's death was a homicide. They say it dispels any notions of a so-called suicide by cop, where people deliberately provoke police into killing them. You just remember our brother and that he did not want to die. <laughs> 
The jury calls for the federal government to reinstate a policing model in which Mi'kmaq peace officers work with the RCMP, a program people in Levi's New Brunswick communities say was cut. For the RCMP, the jury recommends mandatory First Nation cultural sensitivity training for cadets, dedicated liaison officers at detachments near First Nations communities, and better training for RCFP officers on crisis intervention and de-escalation. The inquest heard Mounties currently receive a three-hour online course in de-escalation with no practical exercises. Scrutiny over how police in Canada interact with Indigenous communities is more intense than ever after a string of fatal shootings, including single mother Chantal Moore in Edmonston, New Brunswick last year, and Jared Lowndes, a father of two, in Campbell River, B.C. in July. Levi's family knows the jury's recommendations are not binding. It's up to the departments to adapt the recommendations in their, in their organizations. In a statement, RCMP headquarters says it will carefully consider the recommendations, which also include faster national rollout of body-worn cameras and more detox centers on First Nations reserves. Levi struggled with addiction and with mental illness. New Brunswick prosecutors cleared the RCMP officers of any wrongdoing. The question now is what actions will be taken to prevent similar confrontations and tragedies in future. Ross Lord, Global News. A U.S. delegation is meeting with Taliban leaders in Qatar this weekend, the first in-person talks since the U.S. military withdrew from Afghanistan. The Taliban ruled out helping the U.S. keep extremist groups out of the country. The bold statement comes after a deadly suicide bombing. Jennifer Johnson reports, and a warning, some images here are graphic. Afghanistan's violent regime change has not stopped deadly violence in the country. Saturday saw mass funerals for the 46 people killed in a suicide bombing at a mosque Friday. Images of the attack are horrific. The Shia mosque was packed for Friday prayers. Less than 24 hours later, the Taliban has told the U.S. and Western allies it will not cooperate in ridding Afghanistan of extremists. Not the compromise U.S. officials wanted, but what many Afghans feared and why so many fled their country. I was happy there, but uh, when the Taliban came, we were in danger. Senior Taliban rulers are meeting with diplomats from Western countries, including Canada this weekend in Doha, already dismissing a plan to crack down on extremist groups. ISIS is seen as the terror group that poses the greatest international security threat. Military experts say they can organize almost anywhere. The reality is global terrorist groups like al-Qaeda or ISIS can go a lot of places. So Afghanistan is not unique in that standpoint. They could operate from Pakistan or somewhere else. Also central to this weekend's talks is the evacuation of additional Afghans, especially those who helped allied forces, countries like the U.S. and Canada, during the war. The Biden administration insists that remains a top priority. We, of course, will continue to um, uh, work in partnership with uh, leaders in the region to uh, work to get uh, partners who stood by our side uh, out of Afghanistan. For now, security in Afghanistan remains very unstable. The future, for millions, as uncertain as ever. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Coming up, how the rest of the world can support Afghans with the Taliban in power. The pandemic has forced many Canadians to reevaluate goals and priorities. And this is especially true when it comes to people's careers. And for those who worked nine to five, the stress of the last 18 months has even pushed some of them into entrepreneurship. And Gaviola looks at the pandemic pivot to become your own boss. Tamara Robbins Griffith started her own interior design business during the pandemic to escape the routine of many in the regular workforce. Pre-COVID, I had a corporate job with a really long commute. I was always the last mom picking my kids up from daycare, ordering food for dinner in the car on the way there. You know, there just wasn't a lot of flexibility. She says it wasn't an easy decision and starting her own company comes with a lot of risk, but the reward is the flexibility she and her family needed. COVID forced me, like a lot of other people, to take that risk. It's like you have the golden handcuffs of those corporate benefits that can be really hard to let go of. Official data on the number of people who've decided to become their own boss during the pandemic is hard to come by. According to Statistics Canada, the number of new businesses opening peaked in the summer of 2020, and entrepreneurship levels have remained strong at the start of this year. According to the latest job snapshot, nearly a quarter million people are self-employed. Many of them are running their own business. 
Amy Lockwood had worked in kids' media for years. The pandemic left her jobless and without childcare, so she started making wooden toys for fun. I started using power tools and building things, and I'm disabled myself. My son and I both have a genetic disorder that affects all our joints and all our connective tissue. Her dabbling led her to create a line of toys designed to promote inclusion for people living with disabilities. She launched in November and hasn't looked back since. I sold out of all my toys uh, in less than 24 hours and recouped my initial investment in the first day. Being your own boss isn't for the faint of heart. When you have that um, personal stake in the business, you're working hard for yourself, not some you know, global multinational to profit from it. But those who've made the leap say one of the biggest rewards is personal satisfaction you just don't get from a regular nine to five. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, how a former Afghan ambassador to Canada says countries should engage with the Taliban. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is starting off this Thanksgiving weekend by meeting a family new to Canada. Trudeau joined community members in Ottawa to connect with his family, recently resettled from Afghanistan, including their two young children. Trudeau then helped volunteers prepare some Thanksgiving food baskets for those in need in the nation's capital. Weeks after the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, once again, the country faces total economic collapse and mass starvation. This week on The New Reality, the focus is on Afghanistan's women and the country's future. Here's Donna Friesen with a preview. Donna. Hi, Farah. Now that the Taliban are in control, the rest of the world has a decision to make. How do we engage or do we engage with the Taliban? I put that question to Omar Samad. He was Afghanistan's ambassador to Canada during the time when our military faced the heaviest and deadliest action in the war in Afghanistan. Do you think it is right and appropriate for countries to consider uh, recognizing the Taliban as the government? I think that in some ways it's simple. If they allow a certain level of freedoms such as media freedom, which actually still exists, they haven't cracked down totally on that. People still get on TV and criticize them, uh, which is amazing in some ways. But if they continue that, and if they crack down on international organizations or terrorist groups that are using Afghanistan or want to use Afghanistan, whether they're pro-Taleb or anti-Taleb, and crack down on those elements, uh, whether they're anti-Western or whether they're anti-China or Iran or Russia, then I think that they will, uh, there, there's very little room for the rest of the world not to recognize them. Do you see any signs of those kinds of advancements actually taking place? Yes and no. And I think the more presence you have in Afghanistan, if the international community is engaged, if the international media is still engaged, if there are some UN agencies functioning, we would have a window into Afghanistan and we would know what the Taliban are doing and whether they're changing or not. If you shut down and you close the country and you isolate the country and you cut its lifelines, then obviously uh, not only are we uh, jeopardizing the livelihoods and the lives of Afghans, but we are also in some ways sh closing the door and basically saying you can do whatever you want and we're not watching and we're not listening. That and our Mike Armstrong talks to women trapped in Afghanistan, unable to get out, brave enough, though, to speak out. They say this is not the same country the Taliban overtook in the 1990s, and they refuse to stay silent. Farah? Thank you, Donna. That's all coming up tonight on The New Reality at 7 p.m. right here on Global. Remembering Professor Nadia Chaudhry. Up next, how she bravely faced a deadly disease giving others wings. Montreal's Nadia Chaudhry is one of an estimated 3,100 Canadians who were diagnosed with ovarian cancer last year. She's touched the lives of nearly 150,000 people around the world by sharing her palliative care journey on Twitter. The Concordia University professor fought to raise ovarian cancer awareness right up to her death at 43 this week. Mike Drolea looks at her life and her legacy. 
Dr. Nadia Chowdhury never wanted anybody to mourn her death. So in a way, Concordia University lowered its flags to celebrate the life of someone who lived to inspire others. All I know is that I'm buying time, and my goal is to buy as much time as I can. When Chowdhury spoke with Global News in June, she was freshly returned from a trip to the Laurentians with her son in Moon. That's what she called her son and husband. She had become a social media star for her openness in describing her battle with terminal ovarian cancer, a journey that weaved between positivity and heartache. In early May, she tweeted, Today is the day I tell my son I'm dying from cancer and her thousands of followers cried along with her. You know, you don't have conversations with death about a six-year-old. So these are hard conversations, but we have them now in snippets here and there. And it's good because I want him to be prepared. I don't want him to be, I want him to understand that I'll go to a place where my ancestors are waiting for me, you know, and I won't be alone. In hospital, she rarely was, even if her legion of supporters had to wait outside with their Nadia gives us wings signs. Her research as a neuroscientist focused on the development of alcohol and drug addiction, but her true passion seemed to be in mentoring underrepresented students. After all, that's who she used to be. She left Karachi, Pakistan at 17 to study medicine in the US. Over her last few months, she used her life story as a way to inspire change and posted videos to spur donations for a scholarship she had created. We'll just do a quick one. And while it must have been excruciating, she persevered until her body finally gave out on her. But oh, what amazing things she accomplished. Her Wingspan Award raised over $600,000. And as a mother, she saw the blazing bond between her son and Moon flourish. Dr. Nadia Chowdhury was 43 when she died, a mother, a scientist, a mentor, an inspiration. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Farah Nasser. We leave you with the cherry blossoms in Vancouver, an unusual but welcome sight this time of year. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other.